But I, I, want, I want to get back, to, to answer your question, Dan, I, I want to get back to, to something that actually matters. The, the people, the, the, 90% of the people watching this on television will never have heard of non-locality, and, and if, if we could explain it to them, they're not going to care about it. They're, they're worried about Jesus. They're worried about the collision with the Muslim world. Uh, they're worried about, about uh, gay marriage. I mean, this, this, is, this is religion talk, and we're talking about the future of God now. That's if, the past of God. If, right? Okay, so... I'm happy to move on from that, but, but let's, let's first acknowledge that that's the context. That's why we're having this conversation. The reason why we're talking about God is for the last 4,000 years, people have been handing books to their children saying, all these other books were written by people, but this book is a magic book. It could not possibly have been written by a human being. Well, I think, and, and, and so now we're here talking about God and the future of God. So you think that's the past of God? And what is no, the, I, what is I the think future? we can comfortably say that what Sam is talking about, one reason we're having this conversation is that this conversation will lead to other conversations which can say, been there, done that. Let's move on. And the future of God is to understand how a new understanding of science, a new understanding of the perennial wisdom traditions, otherwise called woo-woo, actually can lead to more compassion, to more love, to more kindness, to more tolerance, to more peace, to more insight, to more inspiration, to more creativity. So we become the conscious beings through which the universe will take its next leap in evolution. That's the future. What's that, what sounds so bad about that future? Well, but all of that is good. You should be doing those things anyway, whether or not there's a God or a great spirit or a non-locality. You know, and related to that, and, and, and that's a, you know, a very good point, point but the, what we find is that I tends to... I attends, tends to tend to thou more than I attends to it. And it's just, it's that whole question of having that personal I-thou relationship. I once studied with Martin Buber, who was, by, by the way, this tall and his beard was that long. And uh, he, you know, he, he talked about this sense of personal relationship being dynamic in the, in the spiritual experience. Now, at the same time, what we find, it's fascinating, we are living in the time in which we sit, zazen, we, uh, you know, we, we flirt with uh, uh, Sufism and Buddhism and its many, many different ideologies. And is this cafeteria religion or is it people finding in the great repast of spiritual knowings, the wisdom traditions of many places, finding their own place, slowly but surely, in their own spiritual life. Okay, but Gene, Gene, so th that scheme, I, I, agree, I agree with you about that scheme. There are many people having these remarkable experiences in every traditional context. That, in and of itself, proves that all of these religions are wrong. Oh, all, all how of these, is that? All of these religions <laughs> claim very funny. their exclusive validity. And the fact that you have... Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, age literature. I mean, that... Okay, so... so well, we, no, we no, need no, a, no, that's a very important point. We and need I a think scientific I... discourse on the possibilities of human well-being. Sure. And, and, and you can get as... as as esoteric as you want there. You can talk about self-transcendence. You can talk about the ego being an illusion. You can ask, what is the relationship between consciousness and the rest of the physical world? And the truth is, when you get out to some of those fringe areas, you are getting to an area of real scientific ignorance. Uh, and the first thing you want to do in the spirit of intellectual honesty is admit ignorance, not claim that you, by closing your eyes, can realize your identity with the entire cosmos and, and you, the origin of the, uh, you go get before the Big Bang with your, your, your unguarded intuitions. I mean, that's just not, that's not how you discover what happens. And it's also who you and I have been talking to, you know, who will give very different perspectives on this. I think the, the big issue here in the future of God is that the reset button of history has been hit and that we are in times such as we have never had before. And that in such times, I, I am finding people moving to a sense of radical empathy, not just with others 
sensibilities and points of view, without which we will perish, you see, and you take a very different point of view, but that we are also, I think, expanding our sensibility of what we have called transcendence, grace, love, compassion. And as we do this, I think that there is being created in the world and time today a very unique and emergent spirituality and with it a new story. I mean, that's what I have to hold to in the work that I do around the world, that there's a new story. I mean, let's take myth, myth, for example. Now, I use myth different, differently than superstition. I think that a myth is something that never was, but is always happening. It's almost like the coded DNA of the human mind-brain system. And I travel to countries where I see the stories changing. As, for example, I was in India, and uh, they were showing that great, great the Ramayana about, uh, you know, it's the great core story of India. And as we watched, the people came in, they tied up their water buffalo, they sat down, and here was the story of Rama and Sita and Sita being rescued. And the old Brahmin lady sitting next to me, she said, oh, I don't like Princess Sita, she's much too passive. We women in India, we're much stronger than that. We have to change the story. And I said, madam, the story is at least 3,000 years old. She said, all the more reason why we have to change it. My name, is, my name is Sita, my husband's name is Rama, he's a lazy bun, anything happened, I'd have to rescue him. And I was watching the changing of the story in its mythic structure. The story is moving, I believe, from my experience around the world. I think it's moving to men and women together as part of the heroic journey. I think it's moving to people in many, many different cultures. And it is about the saving, if you will, of this beautiful planet in this, its most critical moment in human history. And that's the new story. Jean, you, you know that, that, that nowhere in human discourse is there a greater impediment to changing the story than in religion. I mean, the, the story doesn't change. The Ramayana is not going to get rewritten based You're on that You're talking about cultural mythology, not religion. I, I'm talking, not the I, religious I'm talking about the Bible, the Quran. That's all, all cultural the orga- mythology. The, the organizing doctrines by which 99% of the people on earth who call themselves religious Still are, the past. Are Still the past. Life. We have the internet. We have ABC News. We can change that conversation. Yeah, I, that, that, that is the purpose of conversations like this. But it seems to me that if you the moment you... If you want to move forward and reinvent God and actually have it be relevant to people and have your word God, I mean, I don't know why you'd be tempted to use the word God. If in Generation, fact you you organization, be, delivery. Please. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, it seems to me that you are, you are uh, happily being misunderstood in your use of the word God. Uh, you know... That actually sad. That, that vast numbers of people care about God for a multiplicity of reasons, mo- most of which you don't want to defend on this stage. But why use the word God? Why not just talk about I just told you it's an acronym. No. Deepak. Well, <laughs> well, I have to say, sorry for being so combative. That was because of Michael Sharma, but I actually agree. <laughs> I, actually, I actually agree with almost everything you've said. Sam, I have no disagreement with the deeper truth that you're hinting at. I am just saying is that this conversation needs to take place in a setting such as this where it can lead to other conversations so that this is not a debate but a dialectic where through these contradictory points of view we arrive at a greater truth. Okay. But, but, you... You are carrying around a tremendous amount of ballast from the past, and you, and you are t- describing it as somehow necessary equipment. So, for instance, you talked about these great wisdom traditions that, that he is so callously dismissed out of his own ignorance. You go to these great wisdom Thank traditions, you. right? <laughs> and, you consult, I mean, so the, and, and you're talking about changing the story. And, and so t- what does it mean to change the story in Islam? Let's just talk about facts. You open the Quran. In the fourth chapter, it says disobedient wives should be whipped by their husbands. Okay, so this is what this it is, says that in the Old Testament, all kinds I, of things. I, I, it says that absolutely in does. the I, Hindu I'm, book I'm, of I'm just, uh, Deepak. I'm just picking Islam as an example. It, why? It's true of all religions. Okay, then I can pick Judaism. Would, it, would you be more comfortable if I pick Judaism yeah. as an example? It's the same. Yes, all of these books are, are, are litanies of barbarous practices. But the, the point is that what is, the way Muslims are now constrained to change the story is they have to, they can't change the Quran. The Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. They have to parse the word whipped 
And the most enlightened of them have to say things like, well, it doesn't actually mean you take out the bull whip and you whip her. It could be a kind of a ceremonial kind of uh, padding. <laughs> you know, just a, chast a brief chastisement that doesn't actually hurt. And so you get a range, but nowhere in that range do you get real equity and real compassion and real understanding between the sexes. And that's, to get that, you have to admit, okay, this is barbarous nonsense that we, we should just disregard. And, and religion doesn't give you the tools to do that. And God talk doesn't, is either profoundly misleading or unhelpful, or it's just part of the problem.